Hello, romantics. I'm Sarah Gomez, author, romance lover, and host. You're listening to Romancing the Story, a podcast centered around writing, reading, and story structure, all with a twist of romance. We're at episode 33, and on today's episode, I speak with Melissa Bradford about proofreading, copy editing, the difference between the two, and what skills and life experience she can offer writers wanting to polish their story. It was fantastic getting to chat with Melissa, because she walked me through different types of readers and at what stage authors might need a proofreader and copy editor as part of their editing dream team. Plus, it's great to know I'm not the only one lurking in the romance community, We're both looking for tips and leads on how to help authors along their writing journey. Just as a quick side note, I had mentioned it in the last podcast, but I wanted to say it again. All of you are incredible. Because of you, wonderful listeners, I hit a goal of 10,000 downloads as of early September 2022. Woohoo! I will be posting about a giveaway very soon, so be sure to keep your eyes peeled on my socials at Romance the Story. With that said, let's jump right in. Welcome freelance proofreader and copy editor, Melissa Bradford. Yay! Yay! (laughs) So in case listeners don't know, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and your business? Yeah, um, so as you said, my name is Melissa. Um, My business is called Melissa Proofreads, very creative title. Um, And I am a freelance proofreader and copy editor um, and that is tacked on to my regular day job of teaching high school Spanish. How, how long have you been a proofreader? And like, how did, how did you kind of get into that? Not very long. Um, <laughs> I actually just started up in like mid-July. So it's been about mm. two months now. And there's, you know, there's a long story and there's a short story. A little bit of the long story. Um, my good friend and roommate at the time, Rachel, like right before COVID started, was like, hey, let's do a book club. And at the time I had kind of fallen out of enjoying reading. I was a big reader as a kid and, you know, high school, like having required readings kind of made me fall out of that. So Rachel got me back into reading and then fast forward. Um, I have another member of my book club. Uh, her name is Erin. She gets a shout out too. She has a super successful bookstagram. Erin's got a read. She, because of her bookstagram, was able to get um, advanced reader copies of Other Birds by Sarah Addison Allen. And that was like a super cool idea to me that I was looking at like somebody's like unfinished, unpublished version. And when she's handing them out, she says, oh, yeah, because it's an arc, like it might have some kind of weird formatting and like typos and stuff. So just ignore it. And I was like, wait, what? That's really cool. Like, I actually would love to find those. Like, do we do something about it? And I didn't realize that that wasn't like a normal thing to get excited about, like looking for typos. Um, So, you know, it turned out that the, the book that we got was super polished. There wasn't much going on. But that night I went home and just started researching, like, can I do this for authors? Is there a market for it? Can I make money? Can I do it while I'm teaching? And it turns out you can. So I just kind of ran with it from there. That's such an awesome little kind of like additional kind of thing to add on to being a teacher. Because I feel like it kind of flows right into being. Oh, you know, it absolutely a te- does. Yeah. Like, I feel like they kind of feed off of each other. This kind of like, okay, I'm going to, cur- you know, help correct this or help figure this out for this author to make the story better. Right? Right. There's well a lot teaching. of overlap and like the ability to give feedback and things like that. So I've been trained as a teacher like how can you give comments that help people improve? And so that's been really translating well into my proofreading. And okay, so I I fell down the rabbit hole of like the terms and different like types of readers. Oh, um, yeah. Kind of like you were mentioning, like the the your friend got a art copy, but it was probably more for a review, is my guess, right? For like the a little bit, yeah. It it was part of um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like the overbooked cookbook club, something like that. So she's in a thing where they send you arcs and like recipes, and then they want to promote those books with like really popular books to grammars and people who are in that industry. 
Right. And, and see, and like, that's a, that's a different type of reader too. Like if you're going to get an art copy because you're a reviewer or like a beta reader, yeah. I recently heard of alpha readers. I did not know that was a thing until very recently. So I had to Same look back. <laughs> yes. yes. I've been, I've been learning all those terms too. And it's, it's a whole new world, but it's been really cool to learn about every day. I feel like I'm learning a new, like publishing title of a person who works in the publishing industry. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know there was somebody for that too. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting to see like when, when you utilize those type of readers, because that's kind of how I, how I kind of like at least categorized it in my head. Like you use them in like different points of the story of where you are in the finished product, or that's how I understood it at least. And so where does a proofreader kind of fit into all this, like all these terminologies and all these different types of readers? Yeah. So, um, I've been kind of learning that obviously like alpha and beta are in, are in that order for a reason. Um, and that's a very early stage that you want like somebody to read your book and give you like big developmental feedback. Like this is what readers of this genre are into right now. So maybe try tweaking this part of the story. And then you fast forward all the way to the end of that process is when proofreading comes in. So at that point you want to have like, your story is the way that it's going to be, your characters are the way that they're going to be, and all you need at that point is, like, some tweaks in grammar and making sure that, you know, the formatting looks fine and your quotes are facing the right way, um, because if you were to go back and change some big developmental things, you just have to get it proof right again, so you want to wait until you're, like, almost at that perfect polished stage and then go forth and find a proofreader. Nice. And then how does that differ? Because I know you said you're a proofreader and a copy editor. Like, how does that differ from the copy editing? Yes. Um, copy editing from what I have learned. So I took a, like a proofreader pro course. Um, it's from Edit Republic. It's called High Level Proofreading Pro. And um, the teacher of this course made sure to like kind of give us the official difference. A lot of people use the terms interchangeably. But a copy editor technically is somebody who is also going to look at things like word choice and syntax and give like very light suggestions about like the text itself and how the words work. Um, and then proofreading is just like the full, like very black and white, like this is the the grammatical rules. So then when, when do you think an author, like I know you said like a proofreader comes in probably the final draft. Yes. Right. Like kind of like, right. Like you said, adding that polish to it, just making sure that everything is just tightened up to the very end. So like copy editor, does that come kind of towards the end or can that be? I think so. And it, it depends on what kind of readers have already looked at the text. Right. Hmm. So I, okay. I had a client recently who emailed me and said, I don't really know if I need proofreading or copy editing or both or what, um, and she had mentioned that she already had like a beta reader look at it and made some tweaks that way. So I was like, let me take a look at it. And I said, you know what, this looks like it has been copy edited. Your word choice is great. Like, let's just go with the proofreading because, you know, if somebody's already gotten to give you those kinds of suggestions, you might not need the copy editing again. And that's fair. That's fair. Like you said, if, if like someone's already kind of made those tweaks already. Right then you might, yeah, you might not have to do the copy editing portion at least. When do you find that authors should seek the guidance of like a proofreader or a copy editor? I think all the time, really. If you, if you are, <laughs> if you are self-published and you're not using a, a publishing company, who's going to provide that kind of thing for you. Um, there's got to be somebody who is looking at just the, like the raw details of your words um, I do not think that I would make a very good alpha reader or beta reader, but I know that I can look at your book and like, I will read the story and kind of take it in, but I've always been the kind of reader who can't focus if there's a typo. That's what makes me like qualified to be at this stage is when I'm reading, I'm going to find those things that you would miss or that your friend would miss because they're reading and really enjoying the story. Um, I am like just laser focused on those little details. Um, so yeah, I think all texts should have somebody who it's only their job to be looking for those things. 
I love you mentioned that too, because that is something I have found, like even within my own critique group, like any, you know, all, all indie authors have like a certain either group of friends or certain group of readers that they reach out to that they utilize for like critique partners. Right. right. But everyone does have a certain skill set. And I think that's such an important part of like leveraging that skill set in order to help you uh, create a better story. Like I am terrible at finding mistakes. Like I probably <laughs> like you would probably be a yin to my yang because Perfect. I love. Yeah, exactly. Like just a kismet. But like uh, it would be like I, I focus on the story. Like I've I remember one time a friend brought in um, to our critique group a story. And like in the beginning of the story. Uh, the main protagonist had on a cast, but by the end of the story, she didn't. And it was like, like all within the same day. But see, I noticed those things because those things stick out to me. Right. Where'd the cast go? And I couldn't focus on anything else. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like those kind of things that it's, I think it's really important that like a proofreader can help you find like those little, because you are as an author, I think we get, we get so absorbed in our own story, which is a good thing. Yeah, you know, it we should want, be that way. Exactly. We want the readers to be just as absorbed and invested in our stories as we are. But, you know, we give so much attention to those stories, those other world building details, or even the the smaller details of like, does they have blue eyes or brown eyes, you know, throughout the whole story that we miss like the commas or the yes. periods. <laughs> Those you're little asking, things. Yeah. You're asking, where did the cast go? And I'm asking, where did the combo go? Exactly. So like, it's really important that I, I love that you have this as a service, especially as indie authors. I think a lot of people, especially if they're new indie authors, I think it is a little surprising how much work goes into kind of helping you create the best book possible. Right. And then how yes. much you want to make sure, yeah, you're editing it to the point where readers are really absorbed in the story so much that they, they aren't, no, you know, they don't, those errors aren't there. I've been in a few like different, I just joined some Facebook groups about like um, indie publishing and romance writing and YA writing. And that's actually where I found your podcast, remember? Um, <laughs> and I've been watching on the outskirts. I'm, I'm the lonely proofreader, like, well, I'm not writing anything, but I'll see what you guys are up to. And I've seen so many posts of like brand new authors putting out you know, they're almost a little bit panicked. Like, um, I didn't realize how much like it's going to cost to do this and this and this. And then all of the veteran authors are like, yeah, sorry, but they're always super encouraging and say, you know, you're going to pay it off immediately. Once your, once your book goes live and you've got all of these followers and all these fans, all of that work is going to be worth it. And you're going to make up for whatever you have to take out of it. I have had so many, um, debut authors come on the podcast or I've talked to several of them who everyone seemed to have some type of, uh, I'll call it a quarantine book. (laughs) Right. (laughs) A lot of, a lot of new indie authors came on because they were like, well, during the pandemic, I wrote a book or I decided, you know, within that period that I, Hey, why not make this a reality now? And, and that's why I, I really wanted to talk to you too, because even I'm trying to go on my own writing journey and I'm like, wow, I don't know too much about like the editing process since there are so many types of uh, proofreaders or or readers and editing types and like formatting is a whole nother beast. So I'm, I'm so glad you came on the podcast. You were lurking around and found me because that's something, yes, I I think it's something we can all take away as authors to kind of learn like uh, what can a proofreader offer to authors in order to make their, the story, you know, perfect. Okay. So I know you were lurking around the romance writing community. I was. You caught me. <laughs> so do you have a favorite genre that you like to proofread for or that you kind of like lean into with, with your proofreading business? I would like to eventually kind of hone in, especially on romance. Okay. That's one of my top ones. Um, and YA. And I'm really a big fan of like historical fiction. I've always loved very realistic stories. Even when I was a kid, like the furthest I ventured into fantasy was Harry Potter. I was like, I can handle like the mainstream. Um, So mostly like those kinds of genres. But as a new proofreader, I am not turning anybody down. I've gotten five very different types of texts. I've had a poetry chapbook. I've had a sci-fi story. I've had like a thriller story. Um, So it's been really 
kind of cool for me to try those things out and kind of get into a groove of what I'm most interested in. And it's kind of opened my mind a little bit. Like someday maybe I'll kind of focus on one thing, but maybe I'll also just be open to all the texts because I've learned how to like look for the things that I'm supposed to look for, even if it's a genre that's not something I read for pleasure. Well, and do you have a certain, I know you said you kind of listed off a short story and uh, things like that. Do you, have you done a full, have you done full novels and have you, you said you did a short story. Do you, have you done novellas and do you have a certain link that you really like? Yeah, I, I have done short story, novella and novel at this point, really five different people, five different kinds of texts. The, the fifth one was a, I had the, the poetry trap book, those three. And the fifth one was a letter to a congresswoman that my friend gave me was like, Hey, do you want to proofread this for me? So really I've done, I've done a very wide variety for how short of a time I've been in the business. Um, I really would like to get into novels because I feel like when I am like delved into a novel, I get way more like invested in the continuity of things like looking for those little details like proofreaders are looking for did you say that this person's eyes were brown here and then blue later and did you spell their name differently in the first chapter than in the 10th chapter it's kind of like investing myself in the novel and I feel like I get way more into it if it's a longer text and you know there's chapters to kind of like give myself little breaks and and figure out like how is the flow of this and, and all those things that I can give feedback for. And, uh, and you're open to series as well, right? Because I know that's a big thing in, in the romance yes. community. Okay. That, that is a thing that I think I would have to learn a little bit of a different skill set. Mm. Um, the one novel that I've done was actually a sequel to the, the first novel. I was only proofreading. So there were, you know, less details that I would have had to be able to pull from a previous novel. But if I'm doing something like copy editing and I want to make sure that the the voice and the way that the words are put together is consistent with what's been in previous parts of the series, I might have to kind of go in and read those books before I can work with these authors. And that's like every proofreader's dream would be to find somebody who's like, you are my proofreader for this series. Like, here's book one. If you do great, like you can do my book two and then my book three. Um, so you kind of would like be able to buddy up with somebody that way, but that's, that's a different skill set. I don't know when that's going to come in my little proofreading career, but yeah, I would definitely be open to series. Yeah. Cause I know that's something my friends who are editors, like they'll say that sometimes they will get uh, specifically cause they do a lot of romance. They'll say people will come to them and basically say the exact same thing you did. That's always something I like, especially, like I said, in the romance community is a lot of times where, um, authors are looking to partner up because it is, it's a, it's a team, almost like a team sport. <laughs> it is. It is. Like you said earlier, there's some people who are looking for the cast and there's some people looking for the commas and we need to join our yeah. brains together. That's how beautiful books are born. Exactly. It's all part of that brain trust. Uh, I know you've listed some of your credentials, but I noticed on Instagram, which I thought was super cool. Uh, you, since you said you do uh, teaching, you work around teens. I oh. do. <laughs> and that is something actually I had, uh, I went to a Romance Writers of America. It was one of their like talks and they had a whole talk about generational, like generational talk. Where they were saying like, okay, Gen Xers talk different than boomers and talk, talk different than millennials and Gen oh. Z. So like, oh. <laughs> yes. I, right? So like, and that's something I've noticed from my nieces and nephews who are Gen Z and I'm a millennial. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like some of these terms I, I'm aware of, but some of them I have to look up. So what, yes. what is something different that you found like from teens? I am... 26. I am just barely a millennial, it's like straddling that little cusp. And that's been really helpful, actually, with like working with teens. I kind of like, I can almost speak their language. It's like I know a little dialect of their language. Um, but even, you know, I was in high school not too long ago, but even since then, there has just been such an explosion of technology and phones and social media. When I was in high school, it was a huge deal that we were allowed to use our phones in the hallway. But nowadays, most schools, it's like we're just trying to get the kids to put them away and, and be a part of class. So I think that's really affected the way that they interact, even when there isn't a screen. 
um, the way that they're talking to each other, they're using a lot more, you know, like things that you would use in a text message than, you know, just regular spoken language. Um, I think that's beautiful and that's cool because that's how language evolves. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it is an adjustment. And it's something that I think YA authors really need to take into account. Uh, when I was thinking about this, like, wow, what is it that like YA authors need to understand when they're writing teenage characters is that even their interactions that aren't conversations are going to happen technologically. You're not going to have like, you know, kids like, hey, I'm going to ride my bike to this person's house and ring their doorbell and like see if they're home. That kind of interaction is going to happen in a text message now. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a, a big adjustment um, in the way that the kids are talking to one another. The other thing, slang dies so quickly. It does. It's crazy. You can feel super comfortable with a new term. And then a month later, the kids look at you like you're crazy if you say it. Maybe they look at me like I'm crazy because I'm their teacher. But um, I mean, if I were to use, I don't know, whatever the kids are saying now, bussin', right? If I'm going to oh, say yeah. the word bussin' <laughs> right now in this podcast, if a kid listens to it six months from now, they'll be like, what? That must have been from September of 2022. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's the one month that we allowed that word to be spoken. So um, I think that for a YA author should be a signal to just maybe leave the slang or use something that has been around for long enough that it's not going to die by the time your book gets published. <laughs> right. Or like I always encourage because I work in the technology sector. Mm -hmm. I've always worked actually in the technology um, arena because I work in video games currently. So oh. like like you said, slang comes and goes. Technology comes and goes. I remember reading for a friend once and she mentioned Vine. Well, Vine died like it back did. in like 20, what, 2014, something like Sorry, that. You, Vine. But she mentioned it in a contemporary YA she was writing. But I was like, you may want to think of like it's a great platform to like create in your world. I think that's really important. And it, it serviced the story because there was a video on there that mm -hmm. the, the character found. So I think it was really important, but now it's like kind of morphed into like TikTok. So change it to another name, but like a name you made up, you know, but right. still, yeah, but explain it. Like that's the same kind of platform people know about. It's just a different name in your world. So I, I always encourage people if they're going to do, if you're going to mention technology, just be careful because it might be dated by the time it comes out. So just be wary of that. And I, I love that you mentioned too the technology portion, because I know one of my nieces was learning to drive recently and we taught her in an old car. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister uh, taught her in an old car and I was driving with her once and she didn't look behind her. Uh, and I, we always learned, look behind you just in case. Yeah. Like always, but she kept looking at the front. She was like, where is the screen? And the screen, it didn't have the a screen. Camera. It was an old yeah. one. Yeah. She was looking for the backup camera. Back in the day, we would turn oh, our heads no. around. And I feel so old saying things like that to my kids. I'm, like, you know, when I was in high school, we didn't do this or say this, but things have changed no. so much that it really makes me age in their eyes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's crazy how much, like you said, like the generations have kind of like changed. So that's why it's important. Like you just like you mentioned that the YA authors, if you're writing and that's your primary audience, that you may take that in consideration. Yeah. So since you understand the teen talk, how, what other kind of, you know, credentials do you have kind of in your background that you can utilize as a proofreader? Well, it helps. I have more linguistic background than I think a lot of proofreaders out there. I teach high school Spanish. I'm fluent in Spanish. Um, and I have also been learning German on Duolingo for a few years. My streak is over three years long. If I lost it, I would cry. Um, <laughs> but um, that actually in my very first proofreading gig, which I was doing for free with somebody I found on Facebook to just see like, do I like this? Do I want to do it? The answer was yes. Um, but in his story, he had characters who spoke some Spanish phrases and I just felt so cool that like I could use this skill I was like wait a second I know how to help you out and like there's an accent mark on this word and here's why and you know I gave him way too much information he probably wasn't that interested in the whole Spanish lesson but 
I loved it. And I was like, this is something that I want to really like market as something that I can do as a proofreader. So that's on my social media. I post about it every once in a while. Um, today is the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. So I have a bunch of different like linguistic posts coming up. Yeah. Um, so that's one is my linguistics. When I was in high school and college a little bit, um, I was like big into singing. I was a, a choir kid and then um, college, I was in an acapella group. I've, I've kind of put on my website, like anything like music related, I feel very comfortable like reading and understanding theater a little bit too. I, I was in theater hey, yeah. this year, I'm actually helping out with it at the high school that I work at. And so, you know, I even was reading through our script for the fall play the other day and found some errors. And I was like, should I start reading like play scripts too? Should I market that? And, and say like, you know, I understand mm-hmm. the formats of these things, you know? So I've got kind of a lot of, a lot of different hats that I wear a lot of different things that I do. And, you know, that's something that I've been putting on my social media. Like, Hey, look, I also bake brownies from scratch. Here's a picture. Like <laughs> write a recipe, I'll read it. Oh, uh, would you be open? Cause that reminds me because I am actually a filmmaker and I'm probably going to have a friend on here later to talk about script writing. So would you be open to scripts? Ooh, yes. I would love to read a script. That sounds super cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's something. Yeah, that's something that I've worked. That's just a personal pet project of mine. We wrapped filming back in July, but proofreading for scripts is always highly, highly appreciated because I know as a screenwriter, I'm focused on what they're saying because there's so much going on on screen on Mm -hmm. like, like the undertones of what is being said and what uh, the movements are that I'm not really thinking of the commas or the periods or nothing. Right. (laughs) I don't think I've any wondered of that. that. I watch TV with captions because I'm one of those people. And oh, I've I always do too. wondered, <laughs> like, do they just copy and paste the whole script? Like, how does this work? Because sometimes you catch a little like error in, in the captions and you're like, how did that get there? Like, could I have helped? I don't know. Oh, since you're uh, you're fluent in Spanish, have you ever done the Spanish ones and done it to English, the captions in English? Oh, it's no. wild. I, Some of those translations are, are like, you can tell they're missing words. And I'm just like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have, I mean, the only experience I really have with that is when my students turn things in that they clearly use the internet for. And I'm like, what does this say? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Google Translate. Uh, I'm curious too, since like I'm Hispanic, like what kind of Spanish do, is it like Mexico Spanish, Spain Spanish? Is it Puerto Rican? Yes. Yes, mostly when, you know, in the United States, like most schools are are teaching mostly Mexican Spanish. Uh, we do okay. like kind of brush over the vosotros, which is only used in Spain. Um, mm. And we always just say to the kids like, hey, it's, it's only in Spain. So if you don't grasp it, it's fine. Uh, but I did study abroad in Spain when I was in college for a whole semester. So like my personal Spanish, I picked up like a few little mannerisms. I had a lisp for a while, like from Spain and it went away, but you know, my, my own Spanish is kind of like a combination of those. But, um, every once in a while, if I know of a fun, different way to say something, like I had a teacher whose husband was from Chile. So she would teach us little like Chilean slang and I'll, I'll do that. Like, you know, they say genial for cool, a lot of places, but in Chile, they say que bacán and like now you know a Chilean word. Congrats. I know. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's a that's another experience you could definitely talk, like have, you know, for your proofreading is, hey, I've been to Spain, guys. Yes, I have. <laughs> if you want to write a book about most places in Europe, I've been, I've been a lot of those little places. So yeah. And I'm so glad that you kind of know the differences in the Spanish because I learned that the hard way because I remember we in high school, we were learning Puerto Rican Spanish because just because my teacher was Puerto Rican. So like I knew it was different from what I had heard at home. So like I tried to talk to my dad learning with that Spanish and my dad just looked at me weird and said, what do you say? I was like, that didn't work. Okay, good to know. (laughs) I've even had students like with what what I'm teaching and considering to be Mexican Spanish, I've had Mexican American students kind of look at me funny, like, why is this on our vocab list? I don't know this word. Mm. And a lot of times when I ask like, Oh, what word do you use for this? Like we had the word tocino for bacon. And I was like, okay, well, like what word do you use at home? And she was like, 
oh yeah, we just use bacon. Like that's why I didn't know it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of variation it's even fair. within that. Completely. Yeah. And I know that there's like Tex-Mex slang and everything yeah. like that. Cause I'm in Texas. It's always really interesting. So I love like talking to someone else about it too. Yeah. <laughs> I know the best example I can ever give my kids is like, well, you know, like here we say bathroom and in English they say loo, but the Spanish speaking world is so ginormous. And mm-hmm. like, there are so many places that I can reference and say, well, here they say this and here they say this. And yeah, so it's, it's a little bit hard for them to grasp sometimes. Like even like you said, within the United States, we've got pockets of different Spanish dialects. Exactly. So yeah, and that's a great, like you're a great resource for anyone who wants to integrate any kind of Spanish into their novel or their book or writing in any way. So anything else like you would leverage? Have you traveled anywhere else? I have. So, uh, well, Spain and then while I was abroad, you know, it's you're so close to other countries that you gotta, mm-hmm. you can go like on weekend trips and things like that. Um, so, you know, I've been like Italy and Ireland and a lot of like Western Europe. Um, My husband and I took a trip a few years ago before COVID um, to like all of like the Balkans. So we were in like Greece and, you know, Croatia. We went to Bosnia. Um, So I've been a lot of like pretty different places. Um, On our list is to go somewhere in Asia soon. That's our next like big trip. But I've really been mostly in Europe and then I've been to Mexico. But yeah. Want to, nice. keep, want to keep going to different places. We love to travel. That's no, that's awesome. Like, yeah, a traveling is so much fun. And there's a lot of like destination, you know, novels, especially in romance. So like, you can always use that as a, I've been a, abroad as well. So I can definitely yeah. bring that to your novel. I saw you recently opened your services to previews for authors. Yes. And yeah, most writers understand the importance of someone who can collaborate successfully with our work. Like that's what we've been kind of talking about. So how do you know when you and author make a great team together? Well, okay. So a lot of it, I think, is just kind of based on trust. Like there isn't really like a black and white correct way to proofread. I mean, in some cases there is like, a you know, a spelling mistake is a spelling mistake, but Um, like when your work is handed over to me, if, unless you're going to proofread and check it exactly the way that I did, which would take forever, you don't know exactly what is going on. It's not very objective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of like being able to work with somebody is just having that like trusting relationship. Like this is my baby. I've worked on it forever. Please be nice to my baby. And then my my response has to be, this is your baby and I'm going to be nice to your baby. I'm going to tell you things that you don't like about it, but I also want that author to trust themselves as much as they're trusting me so that when they get my feedback, it's not just like, okay, yes, this is all good. Or yes, this is all bad. Like I'm just going to delete this and throw it out. Um, I want them to keep some of the things that they mentioned and that I might've disagreed with because it's their work. And I want them to know like that is acceptable. It is just like when you are hiring me, you are getting my opinion of something and I want to help you find like the little tweaks. But if I suggest a word that you don't like, I don't want somebody who's just going to be like, yep. Okay. I'll change it. And I don't want someone who's going to just reject everything. So it's kind of has to be like, that like trusting in the middle, like trusting yourself as much as you trust me. And that's what I kind of heard from editors as well, like other editors, is that a lot of times it's about, you know, how receptive is the author? Because ultimately the author does, you're right, the author does have power. You know, yeah. they're the ones, who, it's their story. So they can ultimately take the feedback if they want to, or they don't have to in the end of the day. But it is being open and receptive towards that and saying like, okay, I know that this is coming from a place of we want to make the story the best it can absolutely be but in the hands of the readers. I think what really shows me when somebody is a team player, I, I recently worked with somebody who I sent his work back and in his email response to me, you know, he's like very grateful, like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I never noticed this. I never noticed this. And then he had two questions for me about things that I put in there. And I said, you know what, that shows that you like actually took this into account and really sat and thought about it. Like it wasn't just a a yes or a no. It wasn't an accept or reject of the track changes. It was, 
I want to know why she wrote this down. And I want to like, make sure that what I change it to is going to be a hundred percent like clear and still in line. So, um, I really like just having that conversation. I don't want to send off somebody's work and then it's like, cool, it's over done. That's not the end of the relationship. It should be like a continuous conversation. That's a great point because that's something I've actually heard from other people as well, other editors, other readers, is that, hey, I'm usually, you know, reading through all this manuscript. A lot of times I'll highlight notes. And if at any point it's not clear, like, please come back and ask me, you know, to clarify those points or to discuss it with you further. You know, maybe let's brainstorm or troubleshoot the idea because a lot of times I think too, when authors receive that feedback, I think they're, like like you said, it's their baby. So sometimes they don't think about like, okay, why? Why did they give this feedback or, and how can I, you know, and do I really need to change it or, or can we figure out a better way of doing that Mm -hmm. as opposed to just, like you said, taking it or rejecting it? I, I I always appreciate like those type of conversations because it's a, you can always open that and keep, like you said, keep that line open of communication. So you guys can continue to work on it together. Like you said, just collaborative effort. Exactly. It, I think about it as like, if this is your baby, like everyone says, it takes a village. It's not just the author. It's not just the proofreader. And it's not even just them too. It's the alpha reader, the beta reader, the everybody else that we've been talking about. So it, the book has to be like the product of several people who trust one another and can give each other feedback and do so respectfully and then also consider it and do something with it. Exactly. A lot of people put a lot of thought into it to to help get it from, you know, your your brain basically to, you know, the page, the page in the reader's hands. Because, yeah, that was something I didn't realize. I think um, kind of starting on this writing journey was just like, wow, it passes through a lot of people <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> before it gets into the hands of the reader, which isn't a bad thing. It's just that, you know, because a lot of times I do need help honing my story and figuring right. it out exactly where I want to be and where the story should be. So how do the rates look for like your proofreading and copy editing business? And like, how do they differ? So my style is, um, my rate is by word. There are some proofreaders who go by hour. There are some who like, after they see the work, they're going to, you know, make an adjustment, figure out like what that one would probably cost. Um, but I charge by word so that it's a little bit more like black and white, you can look on my website immediately and see like, yes, this is in my price range or no, it is not. Mm -hmm. Um, For proofreading, I charge a penny per word. And for copy editing, it's a penny and a half. So, you know, it's um, $0.015 per word. Um, So that I kind of created just by looking around and seeing what was competitive and what other people in the industry did but it involved kind of a lot of math, like looking at projects that I had done for free to get practice and like, how long did it take me to get through this kind of a project and this kind of a project? Um, And so that is how I got to where I am. If authors come back to you and say like, you know, like we were talking about kind of the questions, they had additional questions of like, well, why was, why did this feed, why did you give this feedback? Is that kind of looped in with that? Oh, absolutely. Or, okay. Um, I have learned just by like, you know, seeing what the authors are saying in my Facebook groups that I'm creeping on, um, that a free revision is like everyone's dream. Like I want to offer that to everyone that's on my website. Like, Hey, I'm going to send this to you with all my feedback, like either, you know, tomorrow, two days from now, six months from now, if you make all of these changes or like some of the changes and then leave some and you want me to read it again. I will do that. My most recent revision that I did, I found something that I didn't find the first time. It was like a super effective and like great conversation piece between me and the author. Um, So that like revision piece is another way to keep that going. Yeah. And like, and what does your turnaround time usually look like? I have on my website, just a, a question that is, do you have a deadline? Because some authors are in no hurry at all. It's like, Hey, this is just, you know, my, my passion. I'm just going to see if I like this writing thing. Some Mm -hmm. authors are working with a deadline and they need things done by a certain time. So when they fill out my like little questionnaire, um, like how many words is it? What kind of text is it? And when is your deadline? 
I get back to them and, and tell them like whether I think I can make that work with whatever's going on in my crazy life or if I might want to refer them to someone else. And like, so when you off also offer, I saw on your website as well, and we kind of mentioned it very briefly, like you offer like a sample, right? Yeah. Just to see if you guys will work together. You know, you and the author, like you guys work, you know, as that dream team we've been talking about yes. so much. Yeah. So what does the, um, what does the sample kind of include or what does it look like? How many words is it? So I promise 1000 words. It can be the first 1000, the first you know, very beginning of the story, you can pick a thousand words in the middle of the text, but just so that you can see my style. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, I start adding in things that you wouldn't have agreed with and, and you don't love the way that it goes, you can say, Hey, thanks for the thousand words, but I think I'm going to hire a different proofreader. Or that could be like the way to build that trust to give me your baby. If, if I've shown you, Hey, I babysat your baby for a couple hours and it went well, um, let's see if we can do an overnight, you know? Um, so the thousand words is just kind of like a little tidbit, a little sample to show what I do and what my work looks like. Well, that is awesome. So like, we've been talking about all these amazing things that you offer readers and proofreaders and copy editors can offer for authors as a whole before it goes to publish, before you hit that publish button on KDP or anywhere else you go to. So where can listeners find your services and how can they connect with you? I've got simple like Instagram and website have the same handle. I'm super happy that I ended up with that. I'm on Instagram. I'm at Melissa Proofreads and my website is melissaproofreads.com. Thanks so much to Melissa for joining the show. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts so you can hear the latest episodes when they are available. And if you're enjoying the content, feel free to leave a review. As always, stay safe, be well, and keep writing. Bye!